was in the business when she got what they want to do when they grow up, whether it's an astronaut or president or even a princess. A speaker traveled to the places of migrant laborers in the Rio Grande Valley to see if she liked school better than she liked being crops all summer. By high school, her ability to talk the eye of a couple who was encouraged her to go to college. She did two bachelor's degrees, congratulations to the University of Texas, Phi Beta Kappa, fifth in her class, and then earned a master's at the Andrew School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. She ended up in San Antonio along with her husband, a guy named Ron, who thought was her husband. For him, it was love at first sight. For her, it took three months for the man to cut his long hair before she'd go out with him. And then it was love at first sight. Since then, she's been a small business owner, an advocate provider of papers, and an award winner for several initiatives. She currently serves as Director for Consumer Insights for ACB and 2018 Chairwoman of the San Antonio Bank Chamber of Commerce. Her latest project is a collaboration with VentureLab in creating a curriculum that will help parents teach their children entrepreneurial skills, such as problem solving, learning through failure, Adaptability, curiosity, and empathy. With all her success, she's never forgotten her roots. And in fact, she credits her time in the field for teaching her to be able to solve the problem skills that she needs to bear. She understands better than most the importance of literacy and was the driving force behind the ACP Receive the Truth program that provides books to children and encourages parents to read to their children three times a week. She does so much more than the exhaustion of listening to the description. But I know you've got credit for her talk. So now I'll turn over to my fortunate speaker, Erica Foster Mary. I've often said that podiums need to be lower. <laughs> and I should start carrying the box around. But this one's actually kind of nice. I above it, right? Let me first thank you for having me here today um, and inviting me to continue to do great work with San Antonio. And I want to thank you all for doing great work in voter engagement. I'm very grateful to hear from you today for those that I don't know. For those that I do know, thank you for continuing to support an important message um, for our community. I do want to recognize my fellow first lady, Justin Saldana, again. Um, she and I both work for HB, um, and uh, I happen to know she's a wonderful human being who loves animals, um, but I'm also in awe of her abilities and what she does for HB, so I do want to recognize her. Again. I also want to acknowledge that any event that engages women in our community and promotes a message of empowerment is an important element for this city. We need our region to believe in itself, and that starts with events like this. Starts with lunches like this, meetings like Madua's had, and calls to action like the one she made earlier for the empowerment project. I will also start by saying that women are the basis of modern society. I'm not exaggerating, I'm not predicting, and I'm not being dramatic. We live in a world dependent on women to do most of everything at home and at work. We are the base today. Women represent 47% of the workforce in the United States, and in Texas, 61% of mothers work in some capacity to bring anywhere from a quarter to 100% of their family's income. This represents the continuing of a long-running trend as women's earnings and economic contributions to their families continue to grow into importance. But more plainly said, our economy could not function without women. Furthermore, research shows that women are still doing, on average, about twice as much housework and childcare as men, even when they work full time. It is calculated that women are working an extra month more than their spouse every year, engaging in what is called the second shift at home. This is an exhausting, but real acknowledgement of a woman's woman's. And I know that I certainly find myself stretched a little more than normal this year. But most of the people in this room are stretched as well. Our time, our resources, our energy, 
often drained and tired as we are, because most strong women I know are tired. We still give, and we still get up tomorrow and do it all over again. We will coach, we will teach, we will manage money, we will cook, we will, we will, we will. And we are expected to deliver every day while balancing our lives and the lives of those around us. And the consequence is this. I saw a slide last week that shows modern mothers have three emotions always running simultaneously. Self-doubt, more pain than passion, and issues with trying to be the perfect mom. A paradox out there. A woman who can do it all while leading a balanced life. How many of you feel that way to a certain degree? Well, today I am here to tell you that work-life balance is a guilt trip trap to trap women, and it gets rammed down our throats to convince us to chase an impossible phenomenon that we will never achieve. We are told to chase the balance myth and all it entails. Sacrificing satisfying work and advocacy for an outdated expectation that is no longer valid precisely because we are expected to play at so many levels. And that expectation that we put on ourselves eats away our self esteem and it distracts us from going after balance, up ending accomplishments in areas that perhaps society isn't ready for us to be in, like politics, like policy, and power. If I'm out encouraging voters to exercise their right and have to feed my son dinner, I'm probably going to go for a Chick-fil-A right here. <laughs> and I should not feel guilty for that. If I got accepted to a leadership program and I'm not there to do the laundry, why should I feel guilty asking Ron to do it? <laughs> I urge you to consider that modern womanhood isn't about work-life balance anymore but about boundaries that you make in all aspects of your life. Boundaries that you choose, not anyone else. And if that means that some days you're off balance at home and you have to order pizza, so be it. And if that means some days you're off balance at work and have to delegate, so be it. As far as I'm concerned, the only true balance that you should go after, ladies, is in your checking account. <laughs> So why does this apply to the League of Women Voters? Because voting and engagement in policy and politics is one of those typically up-ending things that we push to the side in pursuit of the other. Think about it. The most recent elections have surprised people because women have up-ended balance. The most recent movements that are changing policy around gender relations and women's safety have come about because women have upended balance. According to the Center for American Women in Politics, we outvoted men in 2016 by almost 10 million. That's national. And we have outpaced men in voter turnout during non presidential election years since 1966. And yet, we still feel like we're not doing enough. Am I correct? Because we are told our power lies in taking care of others' needs. I'm not advocating that you ignore others, but I'm advocating that you do not carry the guilt of not doing enough as a mother, as a sister, as a professional. And if anything, it's a change we must own our power in politics and policy proudly without guilt. Because voting is a part of that reclamation of that upending legacy that I urge you to start working towards today. To shape tomorrow, we must vote today. Now, I did grow up in a voting culture in the Grand Valley. My family could not vote at the time they were permanent residents, and in the state of Texas, you can only vote here. But what they lacked in voting capabilities, they made up in political criticism. Now these were policy debates. Most of my family is not educated past high school. But they were talking about real effects of city votes on their ability to work, on conditions of roads that flooded in our colonia, about the fees they paid. 
Each dollar lost to a vote meant less food to my family and it meant longer hours. So I listened up as I was growing up, not knowing some of the words they used, but knowing that it had an impact. And valuing votes because it had so much power to help but also to hurt. It is this realization that the true motivation of voting exists for me. Our vote today can either create something tomorrow or prevent a hurt from happening. Whatever side or whatever aisle exists for you, I truly believe that most people want to help and see their vote as an extension of that generosity. We are a community of compassion, of hope, and of faith. Voting is an exercise in these principles, a leap of faith grounded in the hope that ultimately a compassionate act of brotherhood with your city is part of deciding the future. Now this morning, I got up like a lot of you might have to watch the wedding of Ross and Tom. <laughs> I grew up because, first of all, I didn't get to see Diana's wedding. I didn't get to see Kate Middleton's wedding. I thought, you know what? The dog wakes me up anyway at 5.30. I was turn it on. I didn't expect some of the things I heard, but I was very taken aback by the most beautiful, unexpected sermon about love. For 25 minutes, but still. <laughs> I do agree that to have that much of a message repeat the word love is probably part of the strategy. Because quite frankly, when I turned off the TV, all I could think of was the word love. And in many ways, that is what an extension of a vote is. It is an act of love to your city, to your family. It is an act of love, even if you don't agree with a popular Sentiments are, it's an act of love. And this morning, out of sheer coincidence, because I didn't expect to wake up and hear one preacher, an Episcopal preacher, I believe, I happened to have breakfast with an archbishop. And he spoke of love as well. And he spoke of compassion. And I asked, because I knew I was coming here right after, I said, you know, Archbishop, what do we do when we face when we face those challenges and those people who seek to undermine our faith in government, who seek to undermine our faith in our vote, you know, when we lose faith, sometimes you can get angry. It's all right, what do you say? Sometimes you get upset. People that complain or don't have anything good to say about the city, well, you're trying to make a difference. They call things a joke. And quite frankly, all he said is, don't let them steal your joy. Don't let them steal your joy in knowing that what you're doing is moving forward and trying to convince people that an act of love for your city is an act of compassion, is an act of faith, is an act of hope, and that voting is at the very center of many of those decisions that you will make as a parent and as a citizen. right in saying that there is a lack of faith today. In many ways, there's a lack of faith in government. And a nonpartisan group that harnesses the power of those who in many ways in families are the center of that moment of faith is an upending act. You turn and say that your voice, your voice is your vote, but to me it's also a harder privilege for women and one that should exercise the exercise of fervor. We wouldn't put off taking care of our child if they were sick and taking them to the doctor, and we wouldn't hesitate to intervene if we found out that someone was bullying our daughter at school. I don't think we should be inactive in protecting their future via our own either. It's an extension of the same responsibility to take care of one another. Do it. I know that Manu wants a few Q&A questions and opportunities, so 
I will end with this. Ladies, we are expected to take ownership of almost everything. Remember that. So take ownership of your votes and your leadership roles and what it affords you to the creation of our city in the future. Embrace the idea that you lead in every role you play, including voting for the public good. Ultimately, that is what when you do, we will empower others through our acts. We're the strongest space that the community needs right now. They need us right now. And well, Ron and I both always do things for Jonah's sake. The more and the more I get to meet people around the city, the more and the more I understand that we really all want the same thing. We want peace. We want hope. And we want to wake up, go outside, and just feel like the person across the street is a good kind of human being and that we are privileged to be next to. And we can reclaim all that by showing, by moving forward. Sometimes people are scared, but they all want the same thing. And it just takes one person to step forward for people to know it's okay for me to step forward. And that's what I ask. So, one of the things I did to step forward is that I am donating 50 of these custom made Kudos RP shirts to the League of Women Voters. Money was asking for $25 donation for it. If you can get them in the end, there's only 50. They are in varied sizes, so you gotta hurry. And so, um, and I know that we just finished Councilman Sabanya's district. 
Um, so what we did is we redacted and redistributed, um, instead of it being the mayor's book club and only the central library was dispersed, we asked each council district um, to pick uh, a passion or a, a, an issue that was important in their district and make that the center of each book club. And Council Ms. Alania, knowing um, Jessica's uh, love of animal welfare, they picked animal welfare. Um, and each council person has a specific, but the second part of it was we launched it at the district libraries. So the local people did not have to worry about going to downtown, they could go to their local district. So that was the second conversation. And then the third conversation we had was, you did tell me that we probably have to just be careful not to go out schlepping looking like, uh, like, uh, you know, <laughs> with too much of, of, of uh, sweatpants and, and things. <laughs> Uh, just because he said, well, I'm going to go and take your picture, and I don't want to hear it later. You know, they need to close or something, so just make sure that you, that you have it. But that's to the extent, um, we really try to balance as much of our, of our schedule as possible. And we couldn't do it, and I think this is an important thing, we couldn't do it without the help of our family. Our family really steps up to help us take care of our son. My father-in-law is right now watching Jonah as we speak. And I think it's important to note that an issue of child care and affordable child care is probably something that our city needs to look at.